Right, so what we're going to go through at the moment is the battery experimenters kit. Now we've already gone through the supercapacitors experimenters kit in a different video and I'll put a link into the video about supercapacitors in the description down below. So if you get yourself a supercapacitors kit, what you got was a, a box like this, supercapacitor on it, had contents in it and we went through that in the video. This is the battery experimenters kit and it's much more comprehensive than the supercapacitors kit which you'd expect. Now with the kit you've got a, a guide to the supercapacitors and a guidebook to ink pens and functional inks because a lot of the batteries that we make and the supercapacitors we make are based on making inks. So the ink making processes are central to the way we've been making our supercapacitors and our batteries. So they're really important and it's really important to have a look at that book take some of the information from it and use that because there's an awful lot of information in that book. So you'll get a link to the book so you can download it. Now you download the book and make sure you read it. It's pretty intensive, it's quite a heavy academic book so it'll take a, quite a bit of work to understand it. But the key to doing all of this stuff is actually contained in that book. So that book is well worth the trouble of reading. Don't just dive into the box have a look at the book and get some of the ideas in there and some of the ways of making things in there. Now, included in the kit is an awful lot of really nice gear, but we have included all of the stuff that went in the supercapacitors kit. So if you just want to work with supercapacitors, super buy the supercapacitors kit, because it's much cheaper than the battery making kit. But if you want to work with uh, supercapacitors and batteries, then the battery making kit is for you. So this is essentially what's in the supercapacitors kit. A whole lot of carbon, some graph oil, bits and pieces, some um, uh, bi different binders that you can use, different salts, all kinds of things like that. But added into that, uh, for the battery making kit are an awful lot of really other interesting things. We've got an awful lot of metal oxides here, so some very interesting metal oxides. And a little later we'll go through what some of these oxides are. And then we've got an awful lot of binders, different binders and some salts for you, uh, including some metal. We've put some polypropylene stuff in there, so you can use that. There's a polypropylene cellulose se separator. It's 80% uh, cellulose, 20% polypropylene. And there's some uh, Salgard 3550, which is a polypropylene, polyethylene, polypropylene tri-layer, specifically for zinc batteries, because the battery making kit concentrates on zinc. Then we've got a couple of sheets of zinc metal for you to be able to work with as well. Now, why do that? Well, when we're looking at en energy storage devices, we're looking at a range of devices that essentially begin with capacitors, and they're a family. You can get a whole lot of energy in a capacitor, but the capacitor has its strength, really, in power density. That is, it can release that energy very quickly, but it can't store as much energy as a battery. And, of course, that's quite disappointing. What most people want is something that will um, be both power dense and energy dense. That is, store a lot of power, sorry, store a lot of energy and release all of that energy quickly. But none of the devices that we make, uh, we, humanity, make, can do that. The supercapacitor can store a small amount of energy but release it quickly, so it's very useful and very interesting for lots and lots of reasons, which is why we're looking at supercapacitors. A battery is on the other end of the schema. A battery stores a lot of energy but can't release it particularly quickly. And in between those, there are hybrid devices. The kit allows you to work from supercapacitors through hybrid devices and onto batteries, and that's the point of the kit. So the range of experimentation of things you can actually do with that are really, I think, quite phenomenal. Now, the way that you would approach that is you begin off with an asymmetric supercapacitor. That is a, car a, a supercapacitor made from carbon-carbon on both of the plates. And you can increase the energy density by changing one of the plates into a metal oxide, which is why we've given you metal oxides. Then you can change the other plate for a metal, which is why we've given you the metal, to make an actual battery. So an awful lot of this stuff can be taken stepwise through in order to help you develop different kinds of supercapacitors and different kinds of batteries using the kit. Now I'm going to uh, move to the lab and we're going to do some experimentation with some of the stuff that's in the kit. I should warn you, the video is likely to be quite long because there's an awful lot of information to give over. So we've tried to give you everything in the battery experimenters kit and it's, a, I, I think, a really good kit. There are some really nice exotic materials in there that are quite difficult to get hold of and you certainly can't get hold of them in the small amounts. Um, so we've broken them up and we've put some nice materials in there to do the experimentation with. But it has made it slightly expensive, and so we can't include everything in there. It's just not possible. 
there are going to be some other things you do need to get. Some are going to be essential and some are going to be desirable. Now, you're going to need to be able to um, put it on some kind of charging device. You need some kind of measurement device and you need some kind of load. Now, obviously, I've got here a Rigol DP832A, which is a programmable charger. I have a BK Precision 8500, which is a precision load. And then I've got the Rigol DM3058, which is a uh, multimeter. And these are all nice bits of precision kit and very expensive. I'm not the person you go out and buy those. If we break those down, what the uh, multimeter does is just record the information for us so that we can see how the device is actually performing when we've made it. Don't need to spend that amount of money. There are plenty of things available. This is a, a rather cheap and simple digital multimeter. And I got it from the local electronics store. I think it cost me about £10. So it's, it's really quite cheap. You'd need two, one to measure the volts, one to measure the amps. And remember, it's volts in parallel amps in series when you connect it up. And you just turn it on and you can make uh, readings out of that. So that's uh, quite a useful little thing that's not very expensive. It does become a little tedious, obviously, because you're uh, then watching the thing all of the time. And, and that can be quite tedious. It's much nicer to log it. This is a data logging multimeter from Sealy. It's a TA203, I think that was about £100, and it has a USB port that will output um, to your computer. It comes with a bit of software, and you can get a nice graph using the um, Sealy TA203. Uh, we use that quite a lot, actually. It's quite a nice piece of kit. It's inexpensive, and does a nice job for logging your data that you don't have to sit and watch that forever. So that's a nice bit of kit. So if you're looking at measurement and you're looking at those kind of things, obviously you want to go overboard, you can get a Rigol. Um, so really good ways of um, measuring and capturing the data from your battery experimentation. You're going to need to do that because you're going to need to do comparison. The next thing you need is some way of charging it. Now charging it um, needn't be that expensive. This is a bench top regulated power supply, 0 to 30 volts. 0.5 amps DC. It's a nice little analogue thing. I think that was about £50. Uh, it's got a transformer in there. You can feel the weight of it. So it doesn't need to be expensive to get yourself a little desktop charging unit. The other thing that can be expensive, actually, is the load. Obviously, this is a precision load, so I discharge it through this. There are many kinds of loads that you can use. You can just put a straightforward resistor on it, and then if you know the resistance, then you can work out the power. So you put a, just a resistor on as your load, it's going to be really cheap. Uh, that can be a little tedious, because you just get a resistor. But um, you can also use things like strip LEDs, which we use quite a lot. And the other thing we use quite a lot, because it's kind of fun to see it, and, and it gives you some kind of movement, is a little motor. Now, I get these motors um, from those quadcopters they sell in the pound stores. You, you buy a cheap quadcopter about four or five pounds, and you'll be able to pull out four of these little motors. And they're quite useful, so I pull those four motors out, and then mount it on a little bit of plastic so you don't have to hold it. And that gives a nice way of getting a visual representation of um, the discharge. Now, it's an unregulated discharge, as are um, the LEDs, incidentally. It's unregulated, but it's really nice to see it. And we've got a, a specific capacitor here. So this is a capacitor I'm charging here. It's on charge at the moment. If I just turn that charge off, then I can connect that up, and it'll give me a nice little, there you go. And that'll whiz around for absolutely ages, actually. Uh, it's actually quite impressive because this supercapacitor is um, basically, uh, I think it's two centimetres by four centimetres, and it will power that little motor for quite a long time. So it's quite nice to be able to do that. Then, while you're doing that, you've got an estimation of how long it uses, and just grab yourself a stopwatch because you'll be able to um, just stop and start that to give you an idea of how much time that motor will run if you don't have the other measuring equipment. You can still get an idea of how much power is being put through that motor. So, some way of uh, applying a charge, recording your data, and applying a load to your device. Your devices are something that's going to be essential to you. Now, the other thing that's probably essential is quite humble it's this thing. You can't just pour the stuff into a cup and give them a mix with a spoon and hope it's going to work. It's not. It's all about intimacy and contact, uh, thoroughness of dispersion. And a mortar and pestle will help you get a reasonable, uh, do a reasonable job of that to be able to grind those materials up so you can make an ink or paint out of them. Uh, the guide with ink and paint making is obviously in the ink and paint making book, so have a look at that. Now, the other thing uh, you finally need, really, is somewhere to hold these things together. Now, very often when I do this, I just slap them on the bench, and then I'll just leave them there. But I work in a lab, and I've got a glass top, and it doesn't matter if I spill things on the floor. Quite often it does matter. So you need some kind of way of 
putting your battery together in a, in a unit that will spill things absolutely everywhere. And the three choices I have on that, one is I have a CR2032 machine, which uh, makes me little button cells. That was £3,000, so it's a bit expensive. And the other is to use these things. These things are uh, credit card size laminating wallets, and they go through a little home laminator, like that, and they make you some really nice cells, like that. That one's actually a rechargeable zinc manganese dioxide battery. Uh, this one here is in fact a smaller version of this supercapacitor that we've got there. So it makes nice little cells that you can experiment with time and time again for looks of things like degradation and off-gassing and all that sort of change of colour of electrolyte, um, whether the particles are floating off, all that kind of thing. It gives you a nice inspection way of looking at your cell that you make and it's a nice robust cell and, and it'll last for ages. And the other way is uh, to get yourself a bit of capped on tape, and forgive me for a moment, I forgot to get that together. <clears throat> and we have a bit of Capton tape there on a tape dispenser and I can just pull off a length of Capton tape and then I can take my battery and I can wrap the tape around the battery to make an Capton enca encapsulated cell. This one is another, uh, this is actually zinc vanadium this one. So this is a zinc vanadium battery where I've laid the two top of, on top of each other, wrapped it with Capton, left an opening there, and then I can put the electrolyte in there to make that cell. So there's lots of different ways that you can actually encapsulate. There's lots of different ways that you can record your data and provide a load. Uh, you'll need to acquire those things yourself, and you probably got some, or you will get them quite quickly when you begin your battery experimentation. As I say, it's not possible for us to include it in here, because um, it would just be hundreds upon hundreds of pounds. So those things you're going to need to acquire for yourself. Oh, incidentally, that supercapacitor is still running. There you go. So the kit is an experimenter's kit. You're meant to experiment. You're meant to explore. It contains a supercapacitor kit, but on top of it, it's got a whole load of metal oxide and some metals. Because what we're looking at is that progression from supercapacitor to hybrid device to battery. So you can explore those kind of things. And we're going to go through that in a little example later on. Uh, if you want to know how to handle the carbons and what carbons are in there, watch the supercapacitor video. It's got some ketchin in there, it's got some graphene in there, it's got some activated carbon from coconut fibre in there, and it's got some 5 micron graphite, four different carbons. So you can make different supercapacitors. We're going to use some of those carbons in the um, inks that we make in order to make the uh, metal oxide layers that we're going to be using. And so we'll use some of that material there. Now, so the exciting things, as I say, are the oxides, believe it or not. Now, they are chemicals, so you need to treat them with appropriate PPE. In this case, a pair of gloves is fine, because most of these things are actually used as um, pottery glazers, which is the nickel oxide and the vanadium pentoxide are, in fact, pottery glazers. Um, the, there is some uh, zinc oxide in there. That's actually used to make your uh, sunscreen lotion, it's used on sunscreen. So it's pretty harmless stuff. And there's some manganese dioxide in there, which is what you find in your normal AA battery. So some really good oxides in there to be playing around with. We're going to play around with this orange powder, which is a vanadium pentoxide, and we're needing to make a vanadium pentoxide zinc battery. That's what we're going to end up making. So we're going to play around that with that a little bit. As I said, this is a basis of exploration. You need to be looking at this kind of thing. Make sure you do read that ink making book. For example, if I take the um, nickel oxide and I dissolve that nickel oxide in some uh, hydrochloric acid, which is uh, brick cleaner, muriatic acid, it'll form nickel chloride. Uh, if I then add a little bit of sodium hydroxide to that, it'll precipitate out as nickel hydroxide. You filter that, and then if to that I add some ordinary household bleach, what I get is nickel oxyhydroxide. Nickel oxyhydroxide is the active component to any nickel iron battery. So when you look at these materials, have a read around them to see what other playing around you can do with them in order to make them different from what you've been given. Because what you've been given is a basic step there are other things you can do to it. So, for example, this um, yellow-orange powder, it's vanadium pentoxide. If I add another salt to that and heat that up, it'll go this reddish colour, and that's a pillared vanadium oxide. So you need to have a look at those, do a search on pillared vanadium oxides, have a look how to make them, and then you can change that into a pillared vanadium oxide. So there's lots and lots of things you can do with these materials. There are lots of ways we combine them to start experimenting with them. Now, let's make um, a simple oxide ink so that we can use that to um, 
make some of our devices later on. So one of the things I forgot to mention as an essential bit of kit is a balance. Now obviously we use an analytical balance such as this uh, Erkling NA114, they're quite expensive, but another really useful thing are these things which are just jewellers balances. So this is a jewellers balance bought off eBay, I think it was about £10. It measures um, down to a few grams or so, which is kind of useful, a few points of a gram, and she's um, hundredths of a gram, which is kind of useful. So you set the whole thing up, tar it so you've got some weight, and we're going to make that uh, vanadium pentoxide ink that we're going to use in our device. Now, we really don't use much of this stuff. We've given you a little bit, but there's a lot there, because we use points of a gram, really. So I'm going to put in one gram of my vanadium salt. So here's my one gram of my vanadium pentoxide, pop that away. Now in order to make this conductive, because this will be non-conductive, I need to add a conductive added additive. And we need to reach something called the percolation threshold. That is the amount of additive we add in order to make it conductive. Less than that, it's not going to conduct at all. More than that, it's a bit of a waste. It's obvious why, it's because when you add the particles, if they're in touch, there's a conductive pathway, so we get a threshold at which all the particles can, can touch, and they form a conductive pathway, and that's what we actually need. Now, usually a good guide to this is somewhere between 10 and 20% by weight of conductive additive to your metal oxide. So we've got one gram of here, let's say we'll put 20% in, we need 0.2 of a gram of our 5 micron graphite, which is what I'm just adding now. There we go. So a tiny, tiny amounts are actually what's needed. And we've got this amount, which is going to make our metal oxide additive onto our electrode. So we can pop that away. Now again, with things like um, the amount of binder you put in, you need something in the region of about 10 to 20% by weight of binder. So very small amounts of this stuff are done. What I normally do is, when it's all in the boat, I just dribble a little bit of binder on it. So if I put a little bit of binder on, there's about a couple of millilitres there, so it's far too much. And then I'm going to mix that together. Now, it's quite difficult to mix that together, because the binder will um, be sucked into the dry salt that we've just added there. So what we need to do is add a little bit of DI water to help us mix it. So put a little bit of deionized water in there, and I've added five milliliters of DI water, and we can give that a go around. quite quickly it made our vanadium pentoxide ink. Now it's going a kind of green colour, which is what you'd expect it to do because it's changing its oxidation state from what we've done to it. And if you pour that into a little pot, you'll be able to use that for loads and loads of things. Now we apply these normally with a brush. So a little artist brush is fine. Cut yourself a bit of graph oil. Paint your ink on. And once you've given that time to dry, you're ready to go. Now you can just leave it to dry, or you can turn a hairdryer on it to um, speed up that drying process. That's all there is to these things. When you're making those inks, it's the same process, really. On the basic level, you need your ink, a conductive additive, a binder, and a carrier. So the binder is uh, the CMC, the conductive additive was the graphite, the metal salt that we used was an oxide, and it was vanadium pentoxide and the carrier we used was water. Give them a grand around. The longer you grind them, the better it's going to be because it's all about dispersion. It's all about getting those things thoroughly mixed. I gave that just a couple of seconds or so and, and left it because I was quite happy with it. 
just keep on doing it. Do it until you're bored of it, do it a little, do it a lot, see what kind of effects that grinding time has. If you've got some way of mechanically grinding it so you don't have to do it with your hand, find a way of mechanically doing it. Lots of things to experiment in just making the inks. There are lots of different carrier binder systems that you can be using and they're all detailed in the ink making book. Now, I've made previous sheets because uh, it helps me with this. And that's a vanadium pentoxide sheet. This one's a manganese dioxide. This one's a carbon. We've got some pre-cut zinc. We've got some graphol here pre-cut. And if I go to this, we've got our little bit of cell guard that we're going to be using. Now, when we make these things initially, we were making supercapacitors. And again, you can see how to do that if you look on the supercapacitors 101. Or um, if you have a look at the video on supercapacitors, we can go into much more in depth how to make a supercapacitor. What I'm going to do is just make a quick and simple supercapacitor here, which is a dual carbon supercapacitor. So it's the same carbon on both sides. Now, I cut myself a little bit of cell guard. That can be my separator. Pop that on that. And that's my supercapacitor. It's a symmetric supercapacitor because it's two types of carbon that are identical on both sides. I can make asymmetric supercapacitors I want by changing the carbon. And now all I need to do is add a little bit of electrolyte salt. And in the kit, you've got two electrolyte salts. You've got sodium sulfate and zinc sulfate because they're neutral. They're easy to use, they're neutral, they're relatively safe in terms of chemicals, but you need to be experimenting with other kinds of salts. There are lots of things you can experiment with and lots of salts that you can use. You can even use ordinary table salt. So have a hunt around for other salts that you can use and see what kind of effects those salts have. Now normally when I do it on an open bench like this, what I do is just put a clamp on it because I'm about to connect it to the power supply and I basically don't want it to move. So if I stick that, it doesn't matter which way around it goes. It doesn't matter which one's negative and which one's positive because it's a symmetric device. So I just pop that on. It is in fact now connected to my motor. Swap it around so it's connected to my power supply. I've set my power supply at two volts. A lot of people ask me, <coughs> How do you know what voltage to set your power supply at? Because how do you know what voltage the cell is? Well, all of these things operate at reference cell potentials, and you can look those reference cell potentials up to give you what the cell voltage should be. So if you have a look at cell potential reference to hydrogen, you'll get a list of half cells that you add together to give your overall cell performance. And you can just calculate it from that. Now, quite a good voltage, which I normally set this thing out all the time, actually, is 2. I usually start at 2 volts. If it off-gasses a bit too much, I turn it down, or I'll, I'll look it up and make sure I get it round about right. If it's not off-gassing, I usually whack it up a little bit, and we see what happens. But then I've got EIS test gear, so I can test what's going to happen. And when you're guessing on it, 2 volts a good guess. Have a look, see if it bubbles. If it's not, whack it up. If it is, turn it down. Once you get to about 1.23, it's going to start bubbling because that's below the reference potential of most things. The other thing is look up the reference potentials and calculate what it is. So we've got a salt electrolyte in our symmetric capacitor. It's connected up to this. If we turn that on, it'll immediately begin to pull a charge. So it's now charging quite nicely. And if I turn that off, pop it on here, then we should, says he, we haven't. What have I done? There we go. There is our symmetric capacitor working, turning that motor for a few seconds. So it'll turn that motor for a few seconds, given a little bit of charge we put on it by a symmetric capacitor. Now, symmetric capacitors, remember, are very power dense. That is, they're able to release their energy very, very quickly, but they can't hold much energy. So what we want to do, really, is put in a system whereby we can hold more energy. Now, there's a cost to pay for this. When we do this, what we do is lower the power density, but we can increase the energy density, and we tend to reduce the life cycle as well. If you think what a supercapacitor is, that would make sense, because a supercapacitor really is just ion separation. No reaction, really, and they go back together. When you're using um, metal oxide, you're using a redox reaction. Redox reactions always involve side reactions, so there is loss of active material over time. 
That has an impact on the life of the device. So a supercapacitor, a symmetric supercapacitor, you can expect to have a million cycles. When you do an asymmetric supercapacitor, where you're using a redox additive onto the actual uh, anode or cathode, then you're going to have another effect, and that effect is going to reduce the life cycles down to something like five or 10,000 cycles. Bear in mind that's hundreds of years, so it doesn't really matter that much, plenty to play with, but you do pay a cost for everything that you do. Now, we've actually done this where we had a carbon on a carbon, and I'm going to swap one of the carbons to one of the metal oxides, and we're going to use vanadium pentoxide. I'm going to put the vanadium pentoxide on the cathode, so we get a little bit of our vanadium pentoxide ready, and we'll pop it onto there. Because we're going to make it an asymmetric supercapacitor, we've got our vanadium pentoxide, we've got our salt on there, and then we've got our carbon on top. And if this time we do that, we should see that we get slightly more power out of it. And that was no surprise if you think about it, because getting slightly more power out of the thing is what you'd expect, it's what we're looking for. So if we give that a little bit of charge, then we'll find that the motor will actually run longer because we've got a more energy dense device. Now we've made a masonetry capacitor using vanadium pentoxide on the cathode, but we have used, remember, a carbon, and there you go, you can hear that much louder. We have used carbon, sorry, on the um, anode. The other thing we can do now is swap out that anode where we've used carbon, and this time we're going to use metal. So what we've got here now is a vanadium pentoxide zinc battery because we're going to use a piece of zinc. So if we pop our piece of zinc onto our anode, that is the negative, and pop that on there, then look, we get an immediate reaction because this is now an actual battery and not a supercapacitor. So it's undergoing a redox reaction between the zinc and the vanadium pentoxide and giving out energy. And that will last a considerable while, actually, surprisingly enough. And it is also rechargeable. But just like supercapacitors going to hybrid devices and you get a reduction in, energy in, in life as you get an increase in energy, the same thing happens here. You're going to have a reduction in a certain number of life cycles. So it's going to go from like a million cycles to 10,000 cycles to something around about 500 cycles or so. 500 cycles sounds like not very much, but actually that's about the lifetime of most of the batteries that we currently use. So lithium ion and lead acid have around about 500 cycles on them. So having 500 cycles or so is actually pretty awesome. Uh, this is pretty awesome. I'm going to investigate this a bit more myself, actually, because that is really rather awesome. So it's doing really rather well in our vanadium pentoxide battery, and we went through how to make our vanadium pentoxide. So as a recap, we went through how to turn the uh, metal oxide into an ink, apply the ink to graph oil, use that ink from supercapacitor to hybrid device to battery, and you'll have some really, really interesting results. So, a bit of a whistle-stop tour, and I do appreciate that I've spoken very quickly, but even despite that, the video is about half an hour long, so they can get very, very long, because there is a lot of information here, and there's a lot of things to be looking at, and hopefully it gives you some guidance on where to go and how to use your battery experimenting kit. I personally think we've put together a very exciting kit with lots and lots of possibilities. Now, um, when I turned that on and you saw my eyebrow raise, that's because that was actually something I didn't expect. This is down doing things I don't expect it to do. So it suddenly got really interesting to me from the experimenters kit when I think I knew what was in there. I clearly don't. So when they did that, that suddenly raised an issue in my mind and think, oh, hey, that's really worth looking at. So in the break... Um, because the actually memory card ran out of memory in the break, I put together a different style of vanadium pentoxide battery to investigate what happened while I was demonstrating to you. So the kit opens up an enormous amount of possibility for things to discover. But discovering things is about your effort. You have to do the research, do the experimentation, and when you do, you will discover a whole host of things. It's really exciting. The Battery Experimenters Kit is available on the shop, so if you want to buy it, I'll put a link in the shop for you to be able to go there. For those people who have bought the Battery Experimenter Kit, thank you very much. I hope that gives you a lot of information on how to use it, where to go with it, and what to do with it, because there's a ton of really good, interesting material in that little kit that I hope you'll discover something new too. And one final thing, if you do, then 
drop me a line. I'd love to hear how you're going on and, and what kind of things you're coming across. Anyway, I hope that was of help and thank you very much for watching.